From the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. A little more than six years ago, Haiti was devastated by a massive 7.0 magnitude earthquake, killing more than 100,000 people and causing widespread damage. In the six years since, billions of dollars of aid has flowed into the country. But despite improvements made in the banking system, more construction projects, and improve, an improving tourism sector, there are still some causes for concern. Cholera, which had been wiped out in Haiti before the quake, has infected 770,000 people and killed nearly 10,000. Promises to restore education and housing have gone unfulfilled. Political instability and delayed elections means the country doesn't have a functioning Senate and the current president, José Lerme Priver, was elected in February. He'll serve just a short time until a new round of elections in mid-April. All this as thousands of foreign-funded non-government organizations work on their own projects, many of them providing services normally performed by a country's own government. On this edition of Global Journalist, a look at the ongoing political and economic struggles of Haiti and where the country goes from here. We're joined by a couple of experts on the country. Uh, joining us first from New York is Francois-Pierre Louis. He's a professor at Queens College in New York City. Also from Washington, D.C. is James Morrell. He's the executive director of the Haiti Democracy Project. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Greetings. Francois-Pierre Louis, you travel to Haiti periodically. Tell us just a little bit about what you see there. Are there still signs of the after effects of the earthquake? Oh, definitely. In fact, what happened is that the um, promise of reconstruction has not really taken hold. The um, government, along with the international community, had promised uh, rebuilding the housing sector, the uh, road, the uh, public uh, utility system, electricity, uh, water. But we've seen that um, billions have gone into Haiti and not much has been accomplished. In fact, it has been very difficult for the previous government, the Matili administration, to account for the uh, money that has been spent, or claimed to have been spent in Haiti, primarily the money from the Petro Caribe, which was uh, money uh, that uh, we got from Venezuela to help rebuild the country. Uh, it's been over a billion dollars that has gone the past uh, five years. But if you go to Haiti right now, you would you would have to ask yourself what happened to the uh, promise of uh, building of roads, new uh, constructions of public facilities, or new housing. And my understanding so is that there are also still people living in tents in some parts uh, of the capital, is that correct? Yes, you do have people living in tents, and you have people living in new slum areas that um, they were placed there with the promise that there would be new housing for them. But right now, there hasn't been any new housing. There hasn't been any new construction. So these people, they, you have now new, not only new tent cities, but also new slums that have um, um, been created as a result of the promises that were not kept. And James Morrell of the Haiti Democracy Project, you travel to Haiti periodically. The amount of money that has gone into Haiti, I think it's something like $16 billion. We understand that there have been some issues with how that's been spent, but is is the aid money that's been spent, are there visible signs of improvement in terms of new roads, bridges, sewage systems, schools? I would have to agree mostly with Francois Pierre Louis' uh, disappointment in what you see when you go to Haiti. Uh, yes, some new roads have been built with the money, but uh, the problem of corruption is endemic not just in the most recent government, but most of the recent governments in Haiti. And without uh, an efficient functioning government, it's difficult to lay a floor for economic development. And Francois-Pierre Louis, you started discussing some of the political difficulties that Haiti has experienced now. Just give us uh, sort of a basic view of where the country's politics stand right now. We understand there is an election scheduled for uh, for late April, but this comes after a long period of sort of instability. Well, this is the uh, supposed to be the second round of an election that was supposed to take place uh, last year. Uh, first, you know, for the past, um, Matili, uh, the previous president, was elected, uh, got into office 
in 2000, uh, right after the earthquake, 2011. And then what happened is that uh, for almost five years, there was no parliamentary elections in Haiti. As a result, uh, we ended up by 2000, the end of 2015, not having a working parliament, a functioning parliament. The presidency, uh, basically there was not a election to renew the presidency. So basically you really had no governmental system, no elected officials in Haiti at the end of 2015. So the last try that they did the, trying to do the elections ended in uh, a lot of corruptions and also in fraud. A lot of the opposition uh, groups decided to boycott the, uh, the results. So as a result of all of that, by, uh, when it came time for Matéli to leave on February 7, 2016, there was no real uh, way to replace him. So there was a rapid um, agreement among the, uh, some members of the parliament. Not all of them were installed, but those who were installed, they decided to put a provisional government in the name of Jocelyn Rivet as president so that he could continue the, electo the elections. Now, that would be the second round for the presidential elections. The agreement was that he would come in, set up a provisional government, and then um, do the second rounds sometimes in uh, April. But the first time, Jocelyn Rivera introduced uh, a prime minister uh, to parliament, that person was uh, rejected by parliament. So right now, this is his second try, and hopefully today, as we are speaking, he's going to go before Parliament again to see if he will be approved. If he's approved today or tomorrow, he will be able to set up a cabinet, and then they can start thinking about setting up a, the Electoral Commission to have the second round of the elections and also to have uh, an audit of the process. And let me turn this to James Morrell then, because it does sound like... Uh, Haiti's political transformation is moving very slowly here. Here we're supposed to have elections next month and there isn't uh, a prime minister in place for the caretaker government, much less an electoral commission. So where does that leave us with respect to these runoff elections that are supposed to happen? Uh, we're definitely in danger of, of seeing those delayed and um, uh, there's always the, the danger of um, the... <clears throat> the elections being postponed for a considerable time, which would at best be a sort of adventure for Haiti, and at worst could open things up for a uh, free-for-all among the various violent factions. So um, <clears throat> I agree that it would be highly advantageous to Haiti to hold those elections at the agreed time next month. That will be difficult because of all the delays that um, the professor has just covered for us. I want to remind our listeners that you're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. This week, I look at Haiti's political and economic struggles six years after its devastating earthquake. We're joined this week by Francois Pierre-Louis, a professor at Queens College in New York, and by James Morel in Washington, D.C. of the Haiti Democracy Project. Francois Pierre-Louis, there is this idea that Haiti is a sort of so-called republic of NGOs, of non-governmental organizations. How visible is the presence of aid agencies when you are in Haiti as you drive around Port-au-Prince? Quite visible, more visible than the government itself. In fact, almost everything that has been taken care of in Haiti, from health to education to housing to to uh, even uh, some form of public safety, uh, NGOs are involved. As you know, 60% of uh, Haiti's budget comes from outside. And a lot of mon that money uh, is coming primarily from USAID, from the European Union, and from Japan. So what happened is that USAID, for example, funds a lot of projects in Haiti, and it does that to the NGOs. So you do have a lot of foreign NGOs. And the, the, uh, the dilemma of all of that is that sometimes they are unregulated. The government doesn't know exactly what they are doing. And secondly, they're not accountable to people. Uh, sometimes people have crazy ideas and they want to experiment them in Haiti and just end up coming and have some suggestions. And there's no way the government can evaluate 
whether what they're doing is good or not. And they do also disrupt people's lives because they come in, they make promises, they get people involved, and then they just fold and leave. And uh, no, sometimes people give them money. For example, uh, in the office of Haiti, there was an NGO that came in that promised people housing and asked people to, first they had to give a deposit in order to get the housing. And then one day, the NGO folded, the money was gone, and people, people were already poor and desperate, and they lost money as a result of that um, promise. And the government was not able to put an end to it or even find out what happened to that NGO. And so you really have a, a very chaotic situation. There. But, well, let me turn this to James Morel then, because the, the situation as described by Francois Pierre-Louis does sound unusual in that you have NGOs, basically aid agencies, carrying out the functions of government still five years after the earthquake, six years after the earthquake. How does this affect sort of governance in Haiti? Well, the problem here is the government is so corrupt that you can't vouchsafe it the funds for development. Unfortunately, many people have the right idea in saying uh, the government should support it so it can become more effective. But they do not provide a way to assure that the funds given to the government officials make it to their destination. In fact, they'll mostly make it into the pockets of those officials. Um, the equipment they provide will end up in auctions in the Dominican Republic, and it will appear as huge drug lord mansions in the hills above Petionville. That's the reason why, uh, despite their desire to support the government of Haiti, uh, <clears throat> the, the aid donors end up giving it to the non-governmental organizations, which do sometimes have the problem that, problems that Professor Pierre-Louis has described. And so it, it comes back to the problem of how does Haiti get to the point of an effective uh, less corrupt government. And just to pick up on that point, Haiti, the NGOs operating in Haiti have been criticized for, I wouldn't say necessarily wasting the money, but for spending the money excessively on big salaries for uh, international workers. And there has also been criticism that lots of the money has gone to NGOs basically from the United States, from, from the Beltway, and that a lot of the money is just ending up back in America in the form of salaries for aid workers and equipment and so on and so forth. You're saying sort of the, the alternative is giving the money directly to the Haitian government at the risk that much of it will not make it to its intended recipients either. Is that fair? Is that question addressed to me? Sorry, or to uh, James, oh. yeah, I was, I was asking that to you. Oh, oh that you're asking me that question. I, I am just saying that the record shows that most of the government, uh, most of the money you would give to the type of government you have in Haiti and have had for a number of years would end up in the po pockets of corrupt officials. And so that's the reason why, however reluctantly, if you're going to have an effective project in Haiti, you have to give it through a, a non governmental organization. Because while they're not perfect, there's uh, a great deal more possibility that your money will be used honestly and effectively there. Francois Pierre-Louis, do you see things the same way? Well, you know, it's a catch-22 situation. How, how, when do you finally reinforce the state? Because if you keep giving it to the NGOs, the NGOs have no interest in reinforcing the state capa uh, capacity to adjust their needs. And also, there is no control over the NGOs. I can understand that, yes, you do need... Uh, some NGOs do good work. I mean, uh, I don't want to just uh, say all the NGOs are bad. There are some NGOs that are doing good work, they're delivering health care, doing other things that are good to the population. However, there has to be a point where we have to say, okay, let's see if we can put order here, because there is no way the, st the state can function when it is totally dependent on, uh, on outside NGOs that it, it cannot, and that are not accountable to the population. So um, we, uh, I don't, you know, I don't have a um, magic bullet, uh, magic solution. But I think what we need to do is really invest in the state. In other words, yes, there's going to be corruption, but we have to push so that uh, people are are are, are try investigated, uh, you know, put to, uh, to 
to travel in order to end that stop, that, that, that coercion. And secondly, uh, we, have, we should have called down people who've stolen money. For example, the United States, uh, which is giving most of the money, if the, if the U.S. knows that co-op officials are stealing U.S. taxpayers' money, they should find a way to prosecute and have these people return the money back to the, to, to the government and also make sure that they are go, they go to trial and punish for it. And Francois Pierre-Louis, I understand that you have been involved in Haiti, uh, helping to try to create a, a master plan for higher education in the country. What has your experience been, uh, in effect, trying to do aid work of that sort there? Well, one of the things we, we did, that master plan was done for the university, public university of the South. And it was funded by uh, the Kellogg Foundation in, in the U.S. and the City University of New York. What we did is that we did not, or we, we had support from the government, the Ministry of Education supported us in the process, but not in terms of money, but in terms of logistics. But we made sure that uh, we had an accounting process in place that people were paid after the work was done, but not before. And secondly, um, I should tell you, that there wasn't a lot of money there to be wasted or, or for corruption because um, a lot of the work was pro bono and volunteer. So therefore, it would, it would have been very hard to get any uh, corruption in there. But the other thing also, uh, we, we were clear up front with everybody to tell them how much money uh, the Kellogg gave for the project, what CUNY was putting in. And every time there were, and we had public meetings with all the stakeholders. So there we, we had a form of transparency. And I think that's one of the other thing that is missing in the country is that a lot of times you hear numbers, you hear projects, but there's no transparency in terms of how the money has been spent and also who is responsible for spending that money. So the, the, uh, the master plan went, came out well. It was approved by the Ministry of Education. But because of the turmoil in Haiti, it hasn't gone anywhere yet because the idea was to build a new university in the South. In fact, the Martin administration had promised $5 million to build that new university. The people in Lekai had already given land to build that university. But unfortunately, because of the corruption, the turmoil in the country, basically everything has been, has been on, on hold now. Well, James Morel, we heard Francois Pierre-Louis talking about some of the challenges of uh, doing development projects in Haiti. I wanted to ask you specifically about the role of the United States in Haitian politics. The U.S. has a long history of involvement in Haitian politics under dictatorships uh, during the Cold War, uh, Papa Doc Duvalier, and up to uh, as recently as 10, 11 years ago, the U.S. Uh, you know, was accused of involvement in the coup that overthrew uh, President Aristide. Tell us just a little bit about some of that history of U.S. involvement in Haitian politics, and does that affect how the U.S. is perceived there today? Yes, uh, I don't think it's true that they were involved in um, the overthrow of uh, President Aristide 11 years ago. Uh, it was the foreign policy of the United States to stick to him practically to the end. Well, I should uh, say that Aristide accused the U.S. of involvement in that. That may be. He, he might make that accusation, um, take that with a grain of salt, of course. Um, the... Uh, the United States, after over 100 years of involvement there, has yet to find uh, a workable formula. Um, 100 years ago, they initiated an occupation, which um, probably did some, um, uh, achieved a good deal of progress in the infrastructure, but did not really change the way of governance in Haiti, and it reverted to the usual pattern uh, once we left in 1933. And um, that would be the problem, again, if you have too much foreign tutelage. Uh, the question remains, what do you do eventually when you leave? Um, that's why we in the Haiti Project, we consider it more a question of having free and fair elections and let the chips fall where they may, because we believe that <clears throat> this way there's a greater possibility for reformers to get into government, for the people to choose them, and for more such candidates to be encouraged to run. 
Um, we don't see um, a man on a white horse coming in to resolve the situation. So we've looked very hard at elections in Haiti. We've engaged in observation of elections to try to promote a free and fair process. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Global Journalist today. We're talking about the challenges Haiti faces six years after the massive earthquake in that country. We're joined today by Francois-Pierre Louis. He's a professor at Queens College in New York and by James Morel of the Haiti Democracy Project. A reminder that if you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read our ongoing series of interviews with journalists in exile around the world and coverage of foreign affairs and press freedom issues. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Francois Pierre Louis, I was hoping you could pick up on this point about the U.S.'s involvement in Haitian politics. From your perspective, what what kind of an influence does the U.S. have on Haiti's uh, on on Haitian politics, and is it a positive well, one? Uh, well, I, I think the U.S. has a, a mix, but a lot of times not too positive because um, historically the U.S. has supported. Uh, people who have been, uh, as you mentioned, dictators like Duvalier, military uh, coup that took place between 1987 after the uh, fall of Duvalier in 1986 all the way to 1990. And in 1991, uh, Arisic became president, and the uh, U.S. was very involved in the war in 1991 by supporting the military. And I think the reason that Haiti is in such a bad shape today and cannot hold elections, if you go back, it would be the origin of it, basically, was the coup of 1991. They really destroyed the fabric of civil society in Haiti. Over 5,000 people were uh, killed by the military and the paramilitary forces. And today, the people that you, are, you have in power, a lot of them are linked to the paramilitary forces that overthrew RSC in 1991. And then, uh, since 1991, even when Aristide came back, the army was disbanded, but the, they kept their weapons. So you had death squads all over the country, intimidation. And then you also have the drug traffic that really enriched, um, as um, uh, uh, Mr. Morel mentioned, enriched a lot of people. And, and you know, they have, have, they have more power than the average person in Haiti because they have a lot of money in a very poor country. So uh, sometimes the U.S. has done good work. For example, after the earthquake, the U.S. was one of the first um, countries that came down uh, to distribute help to, to help save lives. And there is a large Haitian diaspora in the U.S. that supports a lot of projects in Haiti that, are, you know, without the diaspora, it would have been uh, worse in Haiti because the diaspora sent over $2 billion to Haiti every year. So therefore, uh, it's a mixed bag. What Haitians are really looking at, it says, okay, why can't the U.S. just support democracy in Haiti, meaning that let the chips fall where they are instead of trying to influence it in their own way. For example, right now, the, uh, the elections of that uh, got uh, Matéli in power in 2011, the U.S. played a major role in getting Matéli there. Hillary Clinton, who was then Secretary of State, personally went to Haiti to impose Matéli as the president of Haiti. She forced the other candidate to withdraw from the race. Right now, uh, the former ambassador, Pamela White, was so close to Matéli that she forgot that she was an ambassador, that she had to meet with everybody in Haiti. And she was one of the people in Haiti who said that there wasn't going to be several elections, there would be only one election in Haiti. And when Matéli and his uh, people heard that, they did not hold any other elections, hoping that they would be in control of all the avenues of power. Well, let me, let me just turn this to James Morel then, because Francois-Pierre Louis did, did raise some points here. I want to give you a chance to respond to those. Oh, okay. Um, I would not agree on a couple of particular points. Um, we're an independent organization, and we may know special defense of the U.S. government. We don't receive any support from it. Um, but it wouldn't be accurate to say that the U.S. government was involved or wished for 
the overthrow of uh, President Aristide in 1991. That was a completely homegrown affair and, and disturbed the U.S. government enough so that three years later it sent 20,000 troops to put the guy back into office. Um, and likewise, uh, the election of 2010, uh, the... Um, the uh, tabulation center of the Electoral Commission originally um, set up the order of finishers as Mirlan Manigat and Michel Martelli. That is, it qualified Martelli for the final round. Then um, there was political pressure from then-President Preval to change those results, and the United States sent a verification commission which recommended that the original order be observed, which was done. So um, it would be difficult to say that the United States changed results in that election. Well, let me let me just ask you, we've heard a lot about many of the problems uh, in Haiti during this discussion. Can you tell us, uh, if you would, uh, Mr. Morell, about what some of the opportunities are? Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Where does it have some opportunity for economic growth? Well, I believe that Haiti does have the personnel in its civil society, its business class, its grassroots organizations and in its diaspora to um, to govern more effectively. Uh, Professor Pierre Louis has written a path-breaking study of the uh, Haitian diaspora in the United States, and right there they could provide many qualified personnel to help the country move forward. And in that way, you could have Haitian ownership while having more uh, effective government. And Francois Pierre Louis, we do have just about thirty seconds left. Where do you see Haiti five years from now? Is it is the situation there likely to improve? I hope so. We have to be optimist, optimistic about things. I mean, it couldn't be even worse than now, than it is now. I think uh, the diaspora can really help, but the problem is that there has to be an environment for the diaspora to go and help and and contribute. And I, I really do hope so. Because, you know, things are really terrible in Haiti. People are desperate. A years ago, they could just live on a boat and, and in Miami. Now they cannot do that anymore. So they're stuck. Uh, they have been expelled from the Dominican Republic. They can even go to the Dominican Republic. So therefore, it's really hell in Haiti. And I, hope, I do hope that all our friends, people who want to see ch things change in Haiti, support a new, uh, you know, democratic process in the country. That's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist. My thanks to Francois Pierre-Louis and James Morel for joining us. Global Journalist executive producer is Josh Kranzberg. Our associate producers this week are Jin Hong Chen, Alexandra Beneva, Joyce Tao, Alex DeRosier, and Inez Kagubari. Our studio director is Travis McMillan of RJI. Our audio engineer is Pat Akers of KBIA. Until next week, for all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure.